got to be honest, um, I'm not used to this. I'm the father of three sons, 16, 18, 21. I don't get a lot of affirmation at home. So this is different. This is, I wish they could be here. It would be really good for them. <laughs> oh, well. It's truly exciting to see so many people ministering in so many different contexts in so many ways, interested in recovering this facet of the jewel that we call the good news. Um, it, it, it's, uh, the conference that has been put together has been really quite an undertaking, and I uh, count it a pleasure and a privilege uh, to have been asked to be here. So thank you to Werner and to Jason and to all the conference organizers for this opportunity to speak to you. And I simply pray that I bring something useful. In Jason's wide-ranging and programmatic opening plenary address, he called for a rethinking of salvation in terms more of patronage than of pardon. It is my goal for this presentation, as it is the goal behind a great deal of my research and writing, to address this one desideratum, admittedly just one task among many, and suggest the contours for such a recasting of the gospel, one that I believe will take us much closer to the New Testament gospel. Because of his prominence in Christian theology and because I've essentially lived with him for the past five years working on the newest commentary on Galatians for the NICNT, I will focus here on Paul. And by the way, I've done the math. I figured out I will probably live long enough to see my volume on Galatians in the NICNT replaced by someone else's, likely when I'm about to turn 80 and it's too late to do anything about it. Um, I could have just as happily focused on Hebrews or Revelation uh, or, or some other texts because it seems to me that this facet of the gospel, thinking in terms of God's gifting and our obligation to return, runs throughout and quite prominently in uh, many of these books. And I would simply encourage you to read through books like Hebrews and Revelation as soon as is practicable after this conference, just to, to begin to highlight, it's okay to write in your Bibles, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of these themes and see how they begin to interweave with other important soteriological motifs. Now, Paul developed his theology of grace and preached about the generous favor of God in a socioeconomic environment very different from the emerging mercantile economy of the Reformation period or the modern economies that have arisen since. As a result, Western theologians are much more prone to speak of God's grace in terms of a one-way commercial transaction rather than in terms of relationships of reciprocity, the native socioeconomic context of Paul, his converts, and his writings. So many Western theologians speak about God's grace in terms of some transfer of a commodity, be it salvation or justification, to a human recipient. Perhaps irrevocably, perhaps not, that's a whole other presentation. And there an end, understanding God's action of freely giving to mean given with no cost or obligation upon the recipient. Paul and his hearers, however, would understand God's freely giving to mean without any external force coercing the giving, without the recipient having done something to leverage the gift. And while they would understand that a gift, to be a gift, comes at no cost, they would also understand that it cannot be received and retained at no cost. For receiving something of great value meant accepting the obligation to return something of great value. The failure to do so would mean fracturing the relationship, and the relationship is the very thing that an act of grace seeks to create, solidify, celebrate, or deepen. Understanding the real-life settings of grace language in the New Testament is therefore, I think, of great importance if we are to understand and rightly proclaim the unity of gift and response, grace and discipleship, theology and ethics in the scriptures. Better placed individuals helped less strategically placed individuals get access to what they needed or desired, 
and they received honor, loyalty, and support in their own endeavors in return. Social equals helped one another in the same way. Rich citizens lavished benefactions on their own or other cities and were granted perpetual honors for their generosity. Poor villagers extended grace to one another in the normal course of living their lives. Seneca observed, and Seneca is very helpful for us. Um, I can't remember, remember where I saw this recently. Uh, it might have been in Jason's uh, uh, manuscript. But ask a fish what's water, and the fish will say, well, it's water. I can't do a kind of underwater voice, but <laughs> imagine it. Uh, but Seneca, in writing his book on benefits, is writing at a kind of meta level uh, about water, the water that he swims in and the people in the Greco-Roman world swim in, which makes his book on benefits a very valuable piece of, of information from a native about this. He says that the giving, um, the giving of a benefit is a social act. Uh, it is a practice that constitutes the chief bond of human society. I'll come to this in a moment. I mistook myself. Relationships of reciprocity formed the fundamental weave in the social fabric of the Greco-Roman world, including its Jewish inhabitants. For a person in the first century Roman Empire, more particularly for a first century recipient of grace, of favor, to regard an act of grace as a one-way transaction would be well nigh unthinkable. If a person were to regard it as such and leave it at that, would be beyond reprehensible. Rather, an act of grace was a snapshot within an ongoing an ever-moving relationship, or to use an image for the relationship current in the first century, a dance. So Seneca writes about this moral obligation of returning favor where favor has been shown. The giving of a benefit is a social act. It wins the goodwill of someone. It lays someone under obligation. Seneca refers here to one and the same someone. A gift, whether it consists of material assistance, social influence, or any other form of kindness, naturally arouses reciprocal feelings of goodwill and appreciation in the one benefited. Thus, favor gives birth to favor, as Sophocles expressed the natural cycle of things. An act of grace conceives within the recipient a response of gratitude that in due course gives birth to a favor in return. At the same time, the gift necessitates this very response. The gift creates an obligation to respond graciously, such that Seneca can refer to the debt of gratitude, or owing favor. Or in the words of Euripides, favor is due for favor. So Seneca will not allow a person to think that he or she may both receive a benefit from someone and keep back all of himself or herself from that someone. To do so undermines the primary purpose of favor in the ancient world, which is to create and maintain relationships by means of giving, giving back, and giving again. Showing favor and responding with gratitude are not about trying to even a score or settle accounts, or earn future favors or manipulate outcomes. These practices are about creating relationships of a certain kind and quality and enjoying the wide range of the fruits of such relationships. A benefit is, again in Seneca's words, a common bond that binds two persons, two parties together. I think it's important to emphasize at this point the extent to which the logic of reciprocity is socially learned logic. It is imprinted through socially observed and socially practiced behavior by means of which first century people learned about how relationships work, how the world works, what values are part of the very foundation of life together. A child notices how his parents interact with people who have helped the family in some way. He goes with his father out into the public places 
and notices how others treat his father with honor and perhaps asks, why? What's behind this? As a child grows, he notices dedicatory inscriptions giving public honors to people who have performed some service or some, uh, who, have, who have built some public building everywhere in his city. And he hears proclamations made that declare new honors for the emperor or the governor or some local patron. When he receives a favor, those who are closest to him stimulate his thinking about how to respond and the importance of responding, and so on. This formative process of social education shapes that child's thinking throughout his or her adult life. He or she will bring this knowledge into any new situation where the social dynamics appear to be similar. The polyvalence of the single Greek word charis is an interesting reflection of the social scripts and ethos that we have just been exploring. It is sometimes used to denote a person's disposition to benefit another, to show favor, when it is appropriately translated grace. Sometimes the word is used to denote the favors given, when it might better be translated gift or gifts, and sometimes to denote the recipient's reciprocal response, where the same word tends to be translated gratitude. This multivalence of charis, and it's also true in Latin with gratia, suggests something of the, the very linguistic embeddedness of the ethos of reciprocity involved in grace, in charis relationships. One of the cultural icons of this institution and its ethos was the image of the three graces three goddesses dancing hand in hand or arm over shoulder in a circle. Seneca offers an exegesis of this image, and this image, by the way, is ubiquitous in the Mediterranean. This particular one stands in the Louvre and was found in the west, yeah, that's right, the western part of the Roman Empire. Images like this can be seen today in Rome, in Pompeii, in Ostia, in Aphrodisias, in um, Hierapolis, in Asia Minor, all the way around to Cyrenaica uh, in Leptis Magna, um, an archaeological site I'm not ever likely to go, unfortunately, in modern Libya. Uh, but this image is everywhere in the, uh, in the ancient world, providing a visual reminder to all who see it of this uh, bedrock ethos. And as Seneca exegetes the image, he writes, some would have it appear that there is one grace one of these goddesses, for bestowing a benefit, another for receiving a benefit, a third for returning a benefit. Why do, the de why do the sisters hand in hand dance in a ring which returns upon itself? For the very reason that a benefit, passing in its course from hand to hand, returns nevertheless to the giver. The beauty of the whole is destroyed if the course is anywhere broken. And it has most beauty if it is continuous and maintains an uninterrupted succession. These goddesses are young because the memory of benefits ought not to grow old. The maidens wear flowing robes, and these two are transparent in all of these images, admittedly completely transparent, because benefits desire to be seen. Initiating this circle dance with a gift was a matter of choice on the part of the giver. Showing gratitude and returning the favor for a gift once accepted was an absolute moral obligation. Accepting is a matter of choice and thus of personal responsibility. Accepting the gift means accepting the relationship with and the obligation to the giver. If one decides to dance, one must dance gracefully and in step with one's partner. Just as one partner's dance step almost simultaneously precipitates the partner's corresponding movement, so the person who intends to be grateful immediately while receiving should turn his or her thought to returning favor. <laughs> 
The first response is one of joy, appreciation, and testimony. An act of grace should redound to the fame of the giver, contributing positively to his or her reputation as a person of virtue, specifically the virtue of generosity. Displays of gratitude, appreciation, and honor were appropriate responses to the favors or goodwill of the giver. But the actual gift or the assistance conferred also calls for some return. The return offered by recipients in an inferior economic or political position might not match the value of the gifts they had received, but they could match the giver's level of investment in the relationship, the giver's disposition to be generous. Thus, the giver's act of favor irrevocably binds the recipient to himself or herself and indeed binds the two parties together. The social interaction of giving and reciprocating is not a matter, or at least not merely a matter, of the exchange of commodities. It cannot be reduced to transactions as it creates a potentially long-lasting connection between the parties involved. Returning a favor is not repayment, hence annulment of debt. It represents, rather, the ongoing refreshing of the relationship and its character of mutual favor and seeking to please and advance the interests of the other. Receiving favor without reciprocating, without feeling grateful, bearing witness to the value of this act of favor, and without being watchful for opportunities to benefit in return was simply ugly. It defaced grace. Seneca indulges a bit further in his use of the image of the three graces. In view of the fact that the graces are the daughters of Jupiter, we should fear that by showing a lack of gratitude, we might become guilty of sacrilege and do an injustice to such beautiful maidens. This brings us to the starting point for the good news, the gospel, at least as Paul presents his gospel in Romans. As Paul opens his presentations of the good news of the gospel in Romans, Paul presents the dire situation out of which the good news points the way forward, as well as the root cause of the dire situation. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven upon every impiety and wicked act of human beings who wickedly suppress the truth. Why is God angry? Why is God angry? And here we come to a text that, uh, that Steve also brought before us last night, which helps confirm for me something I've long, ex long suspected, that Romans is important. <laughs> Why is God angry? God's grace has been operative from the beginning in creation itself, with the result that all people owe God a debt of gratitude for their enjoyment of life itself. The vast majority, if not all people, however, have defaulted on this obligation. This failure of gratitude toward the Creator God lies at the heart of every human ill. Creation itself bears ample witness to God's unseen qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, such that all people, even those who have not received the special revelation of the Torah, are without an excuse. Despite this revelation, the majority of human beings have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images in the likeness of moribund human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they revered and worshipped the creature instead of the Creator. Rather than give the one God the return of gratitude that was his due for the gift of existence, people denied that they had been benefited by him at all and gave the honor due him to idols. The unstated premise here would be the commonly acknowledged conviction that God or the gods, as creators and sustainers of life, merit reverence and obedient service. An important purpose and effect of Paul's mission will be the reversal of the general population's ungrateful behavior. 
their highly insulting behavior in denying their creator his due acknowledgement in favor of awakening them to God's gifts and their reciprocal obligations. Human beings have not only shown contempt for the creator, but also for the creator's decrees. Paul claims the Gentiles had innate knowledge of right and wrong, which they nevertheless suppressed. Jews received the Torah as an expression of the Creator's will for their regulation of the gift of their lives, but rather than enhancing God's reputation through ordered and consistent obedience, they brought contempt upon the Creator through disregard for God's law. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by transgressing the law? For the name of God is slandered among the nations on account of you, as it is written. This starting point of being creatures, incidentally, is why there can also be never any danger of thinking uh, about this contextual gospel as promoting the view that we are earning grace. The idea of earning grace would indeed be entirely atypical in the ancient world. Indeed, it would have been considered oxymoronic. Paul himself attests to this in his statement of what he would take to be a readily available and admitted premise within his argument. To the person who works, the reward is not accounted as a favor, but as a debt. Ethicists from Aristotle to Seneca speak of grace as something initiated uh, de facto by the generosity of the giver, not as something initiated by another's action or potential to act on behalf of the giver. In this instance, no human being, by virtue of the very fact of being creature, can ever indebt God with a view to leveraging future favors. As Paul asks later in Romans, who has anticipated God in giving a gift so that it should be repaid to him or her? The rationale for the assumed no is telling, or no one is telling, because all things are from him, and through his agency, um, sorry, all things are through him, are from him and through his agency and directed unto him. An obvious formula about creation and thus about indebtedness to God, specifically indebtedness to give back to God as the starting point for every created, for every created being. God's response of anger then in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is poured out uh, against humanity. God's response of anger is the response of the slighted benefactor. As Aristotle suggests, when he writes, people are angry at slights from those by whom they think they have a right to expect to be well treated. Such are those on whom they have conferred or are conferring benefits, and all those whom they desire or did desire to benefit. God's anger is the verbal cue that affront the refusal to honor had been offered on the part of the beneficiaries of the divine benefactor. God's wrath calls for the punishment of the ingrate who has used the life given him or her to multiply affronts to the righteous creator. The punishment of the ingrate restores the affronted honor of the benefactor, as in general, punishment as timoria exists when the dignity and prestige of the one who is sinned against must be maintained, lest the omission of punishment bring him into contempt and diminish the esteem in which he is held. And therefore they think that was given a name derived from the preservation of honor, Timae. Aulus Gellius is here uh, doing a word study on timoria, thinking punishment gets its meaning uh, as a derivative of timē, honor, here the restoration of the honor of the one offended. Paul shares this fundamental understanding uh, of the cause for divine judgment and the threat of punishment that looms over the vast majority of humanity with other authors of the first century. Notable in this regard is 4th Ezra, one of those Second Temple period Jewish books that Chris 
would have you not bother with. <sighs> the Most High did not intend that anyone should be destroyed, but those who were created have themselves defiled the name of him who made them and have been ungrateful to him who prepared life for them now. And slightly later in this book, as many as did not acknowledge me, God speaking, me in their lifetime, though they received my benefits, and as many as scorned my law while they still had freedom, must in torment acknowledge it after death. In sum, God's gift of life and all the provisions for the same, creation's unfailing table and inexhaustible pasture, as Fourth Ezra puts it, ought to have been met with gratitude on the part of God's creatures, an orientation on their part to use the gift of life to bring honor and pleasure to their benefactor, making a fair return. Instead, they gave honor to their own created gods and lived in flagrant disregard for what their maker would have regarded as right and good. Such ingratitude could only be expected to excite anger wrath on the part of the slighted patron, setting in wheels the motion for that patron's recovery of his honor through the punitive degradation of the ingrates. But God does something entirely unexpected, something far and away above all expectation of even the most gracious of human benefactors. God has taken a fresh and supremely generous step toward the recalcitrant in order to make the way back for them easier to cross, to facilitate repentance and walking in newness of life so that they might again stand in favor with God. God confirms his love toward us inasmuch as Christ died on our behalf while we were still sinful. While not relinquishing God's righteousness or commitment to justice and to God's own honor in the world, God has nevertheless issued a fresh and winsome invitation in the person and especially in the self-giving death of his son. An invitation to people to turn from their response of dishonor and ingratitude, accept the new standing in favor that is being offered, and make at last a fittingly grateful response with their hearts and lives. The creature's debt of gratitude doesn't go away. The question becomes, how does God bring it about that human beings receive and respond to God's gift of life appropriately at last? The very fact that God would invest himself in this question is a further act of generous favor, wrath, the satisfaction of God's slighted honor as the unrequi unrequited benefactor, memo to me, don't try to use the word unrequited in public again, would have been the expected and fully justified response with no way out and no way back provided. God's love shown in Christ is that further act of grace that has the power to quicken gratitude even in the soil, the dried up soil of the ingrate's heart. Paul expects and suggests rather plainly that God expects this second act of grace to produce rather different results from that first act of grace manifested in creation and in the preservation of life. God's forbearance is intended to lead to our repentance. God's gift of the life of the Son on behalf of human beings is intended to lead those human beings into changed lives, such that they no longer use their created bodies to multiply sin, affronts against the Creator, but to do what is righteous in line with the values and purposes of the Creator. And you could work through Romans 6 as a whole with that in mind. Now the response of the redeemed person to his or her redeemer will bring him or her also in line with the response that the created person ought to have had to his or her creator, to that place of giving God his due now both as creator and redeemer. <clears throat> 
According to Seneca, a gift given to an entire population does not make the individual a personal debtor, since an act that lays me under obligation must have been done because of me. This feeling of indebtedness presupposes that the gift has been given to me personally. Paul does not allow God's benefits in Christ to remain such general benefits without also becoming intensely personal benefits. Paul is careful to stress that though God's act in Christ is performed on behalf of all people, it is also performed on behalf of each person individually. Paul's emphasis on God's love is important in this regard as a signal of God's personal investment in each potential recipient of his favor. One will scarcely die on behalf of a just person, for on behalf of a good person, someone might indeed dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us inasmuch as Christ died on our behalf while we were still sinful. The personal character of this love is experienced by means of the activity of the Holy Spirit in the believer's lives. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, Romans 5.5. 5. And the Christ who loved us in Galatians 1.4 is also the Christ who loved me and gave himself for me in Galatians 2.20, as well as the Christ who loved and gave himself for each one in Paul's audience, binding each to himself in a personal relationship of reciprocity. God's new act of grace is not limited to the forgiveness of sins, though this is certainly an important component of it, as Paul expresses in Romans 3.23 or 4.6-8, for example. Christ's giving of his life on behalf of others redeems them from sin, but also, and just as importantly, secures for them the gift of the Holy Spirit. You could look to Galatians 3, 2 to 5, and 3, 13 to 14, and Romans 8, 1 to 11, as particularly uh, uh, forceful expressions of this. The Spirit is the God-given solution to the problem variously spoken of as sin, almost as an apocalyptic external power, or as the flesh with its passions and desires a more explicitly internal adversary to submission to God's decrees. The obedience that God requires, God empowers by means of a gift, this gift of the Holy Spirit. God invites those who were formerly ungrateful creatures also to enjoy a new status and a new place in a vastly uh, more honorable family, God's own family. This is a huge topic, the topic of adoption as God's daughters and sons, a huge topic in the New Testament. Suffice it to say here that adoption was also recognized as a supremely generous act of favor on the part of a benefactor toward the adoptee. It is not just an issue of kinship, but also an issue of patronage of the most personal and enduring kind. In this place of favor, in which the former ingrate now stands by virtue of God's generous actions, should he or, he or she accept the gift, the person now endures, sorry, enjoys sure and perpetual access to divine favor, all the help needed to persevere in loyalty and gratitude to the end of this life's course, something especially eloquently put in uh, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. In all of these facets, God's grace remains amazing, even and perhaps especially by first century standards. As Jason noted yesterday, there is strong precedent for the obligation of reciprocity toward God, not only in Greco-Roman ethics, but also in the Jewish scriptural heritage. It is apparent, for example, in the first commandment. I brought you out of Egypt, 
you will have no gods before me. God's act of deliverance calls for a response of exclusive loyalty and reverence for this divine benefactor. Certain offerings in the Pentateuch, especially in Numbers, are conceptualized as gifts given back to God in acknowledgment of God's gifts. The psalmist asks the rhetorical but necessary question, what shall I give back to the Lord in light of all of the gifts he had given to me? The psalmist goes on to name a variety of acts that he will undertake as a fitting response. Most of these having to do with bearing witness to God's acts of deliverance and increasing God's fame in the land. Jewish authors express the conviction that God's gift of life necessitates loyalty to God, even at the cost of life itself, which is regarded as the fitting return of the benefit of life. As, for example, in 4th Maccabees, remember, this is the mother encouraging her seven sons to die, remember that it is through God that you have had a share in the world and have enjoyed life. And therefore, you ought to endure any suffering for God's sake. There is considerable resistance to acknowledging the presence of expectations of reciprocity, or perhaps more precisely, the obligation of reciprocity, on the part of human beings in the New Testament, and especially in, in Paul, the champion of the gospel of grace alone, or faith alone. Though I was surprised one day to discover that Paul never uses the word alone in connection with either grace or faith. Just throwing that out there. Just <laughs> biblical theologians, oi. Um, nevertheless, there are many passages in which Paul appears very much to believe that God's favor requires a matching human response of gratitude and reciprocal self-giving at least that the natural, proper, virtuous, and expected response to God's favor would be a reciprocal self-giving on the part of those who embrace God's generous gift. One of the most outstanding of these is found toward the climax of Paul's reflections in 2 Corinthians 1 through 7 on the nature of his ministry and how it makes the power of God in Christ known and evident in the world. He writes, Christ's love constrains us who have decided this, that one person died on behalf of all people, therefore all people died. And he died on behalf of all in order that those who continued living might live no longer for themselves, but for the one who died and was raised on their behalf. This is a purpose statement. One answer from Paul, at least, to the question, why did Christ die for us? The answer is stunning in the scope of the claim laid upon each beneficiary of Christ's favor, so that we would live no longer for ourselves, but for him. Paul declares himself to be motivated, even compelled, by Christ's love for him and for Paul's fellow human beings. His mission represents a part of his discharge of his obligation to the Christ who loved me and gave himself over for me. Galatians 2.20 again. Christ having died for Paul, Paul now honors his benefactor and his benefactor's gift by living for him, for his purposes, for his agenda, to the extent that Paul can say, I'm living, but it's not me anymore. Paul feels gratitude toward Christ and has reciprocated Christ's disposition to be generous. Favorable feelings we have repaid with favorable feelings. For the gift, we still owe a gift. And here, a life for a life. It is to the same response of gratitude, of returning a life to the one who gave his life over for all, that Paul calls all people in his mission, announcing Christ's gracious act and calling all to live within and from the reciprocal relationship God has initiated in Christ, even in this case presented in terms of the benefactor's purposes or expectations. <laughs>
all have potentially died to their sinful, self-centered drives that pervert their lives and invite God's wrath. And Paul calls all people, Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female, to receive this liberating gift and experience the liberation fully in their reciprocal offering of themselves to Christ, who by the Spirit can live in and through them a life that invites God's pleasure and approval. As Paul writes in Romans 8, 12, we are debtors, just not to the flesh, to live in line with it. Translating scripture is really a tricky business. There are a lot of texts, a lot of translations out there that say we are not debtors to the flesh to live in line with its desires. But the good translations note where the not shows up in Greek, and it's not before debtors. Rather, Paul says, as the better translations have it, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. To what then? To the spirit, to live in line with God's desires. But this very giving back to God effects the transformation of the believer's life that allows the believer to live in a manner that is actually righteous in God's sight, thus in a manner leading to his or her justification in the fullest sense, that is, justification as acquittal, as a result of having been brought in line by this gracious act, by the gift of the Spirit, and by its full effect in us with God's righteousness. Human sin, our failure to live out a response of obedient gratitude to our Creator, was followed by the further generous acts of God, extending the means of reconciliation and restoration of the grace relationship. Continuing to live for one's own ends, however, is not a feasible response to grace. Are we to persist in sin in order that favor may be multiplied further? Certainly not. Shall we, bless you, keep on sinning? Because we are not under law, but under favor? Certainly not. Being under grace and having experienced Christ's deliverance from slavery to sin means investing ourselves fully in a reciprocal Godward act. Don't offer your life in the body to sin as a vehicle for unjust action, but offer yourself to God as people now living from among the dead, and offer your life in the body to God as a vehicle for just action. The person who has previously failed to respond to God's creative gift is now, by virtue of encountering and receiving God's love in Christ, awakened to gratitude and its obligations, and thereby positioned at last to give God God's due, to act justly rather than unjustly. Paul is clear that one's failure to allow God's favor thus to reorient him or her means that he or she remains sin's slave and has only death to look forward to. Don't you know that you are the slaves of the one whom you actually obey, whether you serve as slave sins with the result that you die, or obedience's slaves with the result that you live justly. Eternal life remains God's gift, but to those whose lives reflect their reception and response to his beneficent creating and redeeming interventions, or in a more crass metaphor that Paul will use, to those who have indeed lived as God's slaves, putting their lives at God's disposal rather than at the disposal of their own sinful, self-centered, self-gratifying impulses. God's gift will result in human acknowledgement of the creator-redeemer and in transformed lives characterized by just action as gratitude, the experience of divine love and the Holy Spirit's work upon the human heart. The experience of the love of God in Christ must necessarily reorient the lives of the creatures to live gratefully toward the Creator. The gift of eternal life and a welcome into God's kingdom 
represents the ongoing favor of the divine benefactor to those who have lived at last as grateful recipients of God's graces, just as condemnation will be the result of having proven oneself ungrateful to the Creator, to the Redeemer, to the one who had prepared eternity for the righteous. The gift of life beyond death or life beyond the present age uh, is not a gift to be taken for granted in any theological schema. And if they are granted only to those who have demonstrated their gratitude for past benefits, they are still gifts granted to mortals. They still come by grace to us who have no natural claim to immortality. In connection with 2 Corinthians 5.15, what I would love to dispense with the Romans road and create a Corinthians road <laughs> because it seems that the Romans road as the gospel has been, uh, has been uh, uh, kind of portrayed in a very reductionistic way prevents some other very important foundational uh, 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 stones from being laid. And I think 2 Corinthians 5.15 is one that needs to be heard far more loudly than it has been hitherto. Anyhow. In connection with that text, Paul warns his converts in Corinth against receiving God's grace in vain, receiving God's grace for nothing. God's favor in Christ only begins with the death of Jesus on behalf of those who receive this gift. It does not achieve its end until Christ has come alive in the believer, transforming him or her uh, into a God-centered, other-centered person who lives righteously, giving to the Creator as the Creator deserves, living before the Creator as pleases the Creator. The obligation to respond is not an obligation to match the gift. It is an obligation to allow God's gift to have its full effect by allowing the love of Christ to change our orientation to living and to allow the Holy Spirit to empower this life-changing response. To conclude, which will take like five minutes, so don't get your hopes up anyway, God's gift or favor is not a one-way transaction. And I would simply challenge us to rethink and examine you know, what you think at the end of tomorrow is between you and God, but, but at least re-examine if you hold tightly to this idea God gave me salvation and that's in my pocket no matter what I do to rethink that in light of Paul's words that I have put on that handout so you can't ignore it tomorrow you'll have to at least take it home um, and think how does that how do we have to honor those texts alongside those others that we have been taught to honor. I would suggest that God's gift of favor is not a one-way transaction. It is an act that creates relationship with and makes living out that relationship possible for human beings. The perfect gift in isolation is not the goal of givers in the first century CE. The perfect gift that creates, solidifies, celebrates, and deepens relationships of trust, loyalty, and mutuality is the goal of the most enlightened givers in the Greek and Roman periods. In such a context, reciprocity, the moral obligation of a person to respond favorably and generously to one who has been favorable and generous, is not a theological problem. It is rather an indispensable facet of how God's grace works to reconcile human beings, to restore the relationship human beings ought to have lived out before their creator from the beginning, and to transform the self-centered, self-serving person into a person whose just acts and other-centered orientation receive God's verdict of righteous when he judges all impartially. God's acts of favor initiate an ongoing relationship of mutuality. God's gift of the Holy Spirit, through whom Christ, God's righteous one, comes to life in each person, empowers human beings to live out 
this relationship of mutuality. This is not to return to the do ut des mentality, the I'm giving so that you will give mentality of the less thoughtful Greco-Roman devotees of their gods. Though that is, incidentally, not the, not, not the unanimous report on Greco-Roman religion even. Aristotle and Seneca would not uh, advocate uh, for a do ut des uh, approach to the gods. What I am proposing, however, is to acknowledge that Paul does advocate very strongly a do quia dedisti mentality. With all this Latin, this is where my youngest son from the back would yell out, nerd, just incidentally, because he does that routinely. That's why I don't take him anywhere. Paul does advocate very strongly a I give because you have given mentality, which is entirely in keeping with Greco-Roman convictions about the absolute necessity of meeting favor with favor of recipients of favors responding to their benefactors, human or divine, with equal commitment and self-investment. Reciprocity demands that the recipients of God's favor, particularly as shown in Christ, honor their creator redeemer with their speech, their hearts, and their actions subsequent to receiving God's gift, so that they at last live to and for the giver. This is not to promote salvation by works, but it does seek to promote, a much longer quote, salvation as the result of God's gracious action having its full effect in and upon the recipients of God's favor, where that effect includes the response of reoriented lives that God's favor naturally and necessarily provokes where it is received well where transactional understandings of God's grace, an isolated act that transfers something irrevocably to me on the basis of belief, where transactional understandings of God's grace trump dynamic relational understandings of grace, theologians are wrenching Paul and his message out of the social, ethical, and lived contexts in which Paul was shaped and his gospel was formulated, preached, and heard. Theologians go astray. There aren't any theologians here, right? I can say this. Theologians go astray when they seek to answer the question, what will God do if we don't do the right and honorable thing within this relationship? And when they begin to formulate their conclusions about divine grace and human response on the basis of their answers to that question. It's a terrible question. Paul is not interested in asking that question only in urging his hearers, do the right and honorable thing within this relationship. He died for all, so that those who continued living might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised on their behalf.